Uh, my name is Carrie, Carrie Ann Mariari. I'm the Cross Family Senior Curator here at the New Museum. I'm Valerie Stokes Sims. Uh, currently, I'm an independent art historian curator, and I was one of the co curators of Race Matters, the career of art of Robert Colescott. Lowry, thank you very much for being here with us this morning. Um, right. We'll start with some basic questions. When did you first meet Colescott? I met Robert Colescott in uh, about 1979. I had uh, been introduced to his work by Henry Gelsel, who was my first boss at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. One day he just came into my office and said, get your coat, we're going down to look at art, which he never did. And uh, we went to Semaphore Gallery and saw the show and I was knocked out. I was just sort of smitten from there. And then I guess through the gallery, I got in talk to contact with Robert and when I went out to visit my brother in San Francisco, that's when we first met in person. And what was he like? I mean, I think by that point, you know, the humor and the reverence and the, you know, provocations of his paintings were, were certainly there. Like, what was he like as a personality? Well, I always said that Robert and I had this kind of like um, mutual admiration, volatile, you know, relationship. I mean, he was a generation older than me, a black male, a generation older than me, than a black female who'd come up through the 60s and 70s. So we had a lot of different ideas about things. Um, but um, he was always, you know, like very thoughtful, you know, like about things, very knowledgeable. Um, could have a good time. Um, I remember, so, you know, many sessions with him and Frank Bowling, and uh, Frank in, in, in particular was noted for ordering beers and then getting a shot of whiskey and dropping it in, and I would just look at it and drink my Coke. Um, and I think that um, he was really kind of concerned because this was like the moment where he was coming into the new museum sphere with Marsha Tucker's Not Just for Laughs exhibition and sort of figuring out what it was to be on the East Coast because he had a fair amount of success on the East Coast, largely through um, Fountain Gallery in Portland. Arlene Schnitzel was one of his first and uh, most dedicated uh, dealers. Um, but Coming east was a, a, another kind of challenge. Um, kind of corresponded with Phyllis Kine moving from Chicago and setting up her gallery in New York City. So after Semaphore, Phyllis Kine really sort of took up um, Bob's career. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question also, is that, you know, the context on the West Coast, especially in San Francisco with, you know, people like Joan Brown and Peter Saul and Crumb and, you know, um, this commitment to Figuration, um, like what was, um, you know, it must have been uh, obviously challenging for him to come to the East Coast where that certainly wasn't, it wasn't valued in the same way. And, you know, even amongst, you know, black artists, it, figuration wasn't necessarily the default mode when you think about, you know, like Sam Gilliam or, you know, or yeah. Jack Whitten or people like that. Um, well, I think coming to the East Coast was like a complex thing for him. Um, yes, in terms of the mainstream art world, we were sort of like at the end of minimalism, but we still had minimalist affiliate things like pattern and decoration, which was beginning slowly, and the, and the feminist art movie would, were, was beginning to slowly introduce um, sort of embellishments to the, to the canvas, if, if, if you want to call it that. Um, I think with regard to the whole black artist scene here in New York at the, by the late 70s, there had been pitch battles, um, not only with the mainstream for, for recognition, but also among black artists themselves about what was the appropriate stylistic mode uh, to, and what was the appropriate po political uh, stance an artist should have. So you had what they used to call black stream versus mainstream. And um, uh, people like Mel Edwards, William T. Williams, um, Sam Gilliam, Howardina Pindell, they had a sort of like, um, you know, contentious relationship with some of the more vociferous black art movement uh, of people. So, 
Bob was figurative in the way that, you know, the black stream artist was, but he was not figurative in the appropriate way, if you know what I mean. So, um, I think that uh, in, in a really important way, Marsha's gravitational to this kind of distaff, you know, like tendency in the art world was a perfect context for him to sort of, ent you know, enter into the art world. And he was pretty advanced at that stage. He was like in his 50s, you know, like when this is happening uh, with all these people. Uh, you know, I've gone through so many times the uh, catalog of Not Just for Last and sort of pulled out, you know, for people like Copley and I'm going to forget other names. There were so many artists who were doing parallel naughty things mm -hmm. to Colescott in terms of race and gender, gender in particular, um, that he just sort of fit right in. Well, I think that leads into the, I think maybe the, the two big topics, race and gender, I think for sure. Um, you know, I think within the new museum, you know, we have, a, you know, since showing Colescott in the 80s, there's a younger generation that emerged that certainly uses some of you know, the same strategies as Colescott in dealing with racial stereotypes and using it as a way to talk about America and American history. You know, at that time in the 70s when it started, when he started doing it, you know, um, uh, you know, I wonder what the perceived risks were or, you know, how, I mean, on some level being on the West Coast, maybe you're, you know, insulated a little bit from that. You know, there's certain, as you say, there was other artists who, you know, were trying to provoke and, and you know, ask critical questions through these same strategies, but um, but you know, how did those were those risks read, or you know, what, was that part of your discussion with him about the, um, you know, the uh, maybe the, the the chances he was taking or what he was putting on the line by by using that language in his work? I think so. Um, I've always thought that um, Bob's situation is defined by the fact that so much of the uh, political, economic, and social capital of black advancement was based on the East Coast. So there was a rigor, you know, about what figuration meant, um, even though you might have had, you know, like an outlier like William Johnson, or if people had, would have uh, misunderstood uh, Jacob Lawrence's early work before he sort of really, you know, got rolling because it wasn't this kind of uh, photo studio perfect representation of the black body. Um, but um, the, 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 this kind of way of living with a humor and satire is totally different from what you would see on the East Coast. And I think it really has to do with the particular time that Bob landed back in California after this sojourn in Egypt in the uh, early to mid, late 60s, um, where he's sort of made up his mind what, who and what he is, what he wants to do, and you're, you know, in the, the midst of like the development of the funk movement, you know, and so I think that that um, was really a kind of, uh, lightning rod, you know, for people on the East Coast. Um, as I've often said, I was really attracted to the transgressive nature of the work, you know, my sort of hidden secrets. And the fact that he could take a kind of issue or a stereotype about a group of people, you know, Indians, Black people or something, and put it out there before you could get to it or put it out there in a way that it um, exposed your racism because you would have thought that's the way this would happen. And um, I got a lot of flack, you know, for my um, uh, support at Colescott and it sort of reached ahead in 1984 when an article I did for Art Forum became the cover <laughs> article. And guess who's on the cover? George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware with all the, um, you know, really blatant, stereotypical, you know, images of blacks just cavorting, you know, like in the, uh, the, the same boat with George Washington Carver leading them, you know, like across the river. So it, it's a kind of weird appropriation for, and it, you know, what is considered a key moment in art history. And so are these the type of people who are going to be the ones to 
lead the revolution, you know, for, you know, African Americans in this country? It's an interesting question. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I think in, in, in many ways too, because of that younger generation of artists who did, you know, who took the model of Paul Scott and, and you know, brought it to debates in the 90s, for instance, like maybe retroactively, some of those things are maybe not as provoking to audiences today. I mean, I think there's not maybe less outrage around the racial stereotypes because it's now, you know, in an art historical lineage from Cole Scott into younger people like Kara or, or, or Carrie James or, you know, other even people who are now taking from them on some level. But I think maybe what maybe I observed even, you know, anecdotally with the show is I think that the gender is what maybe pushes people's buttons mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a little bit more at this moment. Um, you know, obviously Cole Scott, you know, he had like, you know, a, a very, you know, rich and interesting personal life during the course of his career, but also like, you know, he had incredible relationships professionally with women like you or Marsha or Phyllis Kine, like, you know, some of the most important women of the art world, you know, you know, of the you know, late half of the 20th century. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe conversations you had with him about the way that women appear in his work? You know, for me, it's really interesting because of how critically he's looking at art history. He's, you know, asking questions about representation and beauty and, um, and the intersection of a lot of those things, like not just in his own work, but, you know, thinking about how an artist approaches the history of painting in general around those questions. But, but for you, you know, how did you guys talk about, you know, the way he deals with women? I don't know if we had an extended conversation about it, but there's, there's an interesting anecdote. When I wrote the piece for Art Forum, um, he was pretty hands-off you know, about it and accepted it for what it was. And for me, um, the, dealing with how he was uh, representing women and race was a kind of exploration that I had to have. And the original piece that I submitted to Ingrid Sishi, you know, she, she sort of basically looked at me and said, this is just fine, but it's kind of like a graduate school paper. So she hooked me up with Charles Hagen, who was the editor at the time. And I, I think Charlie Hagen literally goaded me, you know, because I here I am like a middle-class African-American woman working at the Met. I have worked so hard to do it. This, talking about this work in the specific way that I had to like really dissect um, what was going on really in it was totally, contradictory to the way that I understood I should behave, you know, in terms of being discreet and, you know, sort of pretending certain things were not happening. But, um, and when the piece came out, I was petrified that I would have insulted and, uh, what's the word I want, to antagonize many of my friends. The first person who called me was Rosa Esmond, who had a gallery near the Met, and she said, Sims, great job, you did it for us all. So I, I was really, it made me understand that there were uh, ways and sort of people who understood, you know, like the sort of really core dynamics of it. Fast forward, we're working on the um, catalog for the uh, San Jose show for 1987. And I submit my writing to him. And he, surprisingly, was very picky about it. In particular, um, I sort of got from him that quote about the Demoiselle d'Alabama, you know, like how he starts off with European, um, a Europeanized, uh, Africanized Europeanism, bringing it back to a kind of Europeanized Africanism, you know, to a certain extent. He wanted, he wanted me to be very precise about what his strategies, you know, like were. But I think in terms of, of, of women, when I look at his work, there's, there's, there's a couple of things. In the 1970s, you have sort of like um, a lot of voyeuristic, you know, sort of uh, compositions um, and engagement with pinups, which I sort of came to realize when I was doing some research in 2007 at the... Uh, Clark Institute, um, and was reading um, Maria Elena Buzek's book, Girls, you know, and sort of like really understanding. I mean, here's a guy who served in World War II. One of the key issues was that, that sort of poster of Betty Grable stand, you know, mm -hmm. and also um, being able to find and sort of verify later with Matthew Wesley, a source for a winning comp uh, accommodation the uh, 
sort of representation of a drum majorette without pants, um, holding a big um, American flag. And, you know, you're sitting there going, okay, what is this about? And then you see um, Ralph Armstrong's um, piece that he did with the kind of conflict of whether it was like to raise money for the war, but she's a drum majorette, huge American flag. And at the ends of the flag are the are fragments of the flags of the allies. So this is something he would have seen. So the kind of pin up, you know, sort of situation. And then the West Coast too, I mean, like Peter Saul and Robert Crumb, like that was a huge influence on Peter Saul. It was like part of the... Absolutely, you know, and even if you look at Cafe Ole, who knows where this painting is, you know, this woman in a maid uniform standing in front of, you know, Colonel Saunders who's in the bed, you know, so you know it's happening. When you look at Gil Efkin's uh, portraits of, you know, pinups and maid uniforms and things. Um, and then you can, you know, like during my research, I did a whole thing about, you know, like the sort of symbolism of the apron and it's sort of sexual undertones and the going into the tablier in France and leading it all back to Sarah Bartman. So, I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really kind of a rich, you know, sort of um, uh, sequence, you know, like of, of images that you can sort of do with that. Then in the 80s, um, he sort of really begins to sort of deal with issues of beauty you know, particularly through his Bather series and, uh, of course, with the Whitney's um, uh, Sex, Race, uh, Sex, Death, and Art, um, The Three Graces. And in that sense, he's exploring um, ideas around what the ideal female body looks like in different races, color, hair texture, um, that type of thing. And, but also the, the sequence of the Bather series is really sort of talking about the fight for the black and brown woman to sort of maintain her hegemony and her self image against the onslaught of what society is throwing at you in terms of, you know, bosomy blondes and, you know, Breck girls and Marilyn Monroe and things like that. So I think that, you know, one of the things I've always realized is that Colescott's attitude towards women is very much of his generation. And so I don't know if I necessarily take offense at it. Sometimes I sit there and go, ooh, <laughs> you know. Uh, there, you know, like there are times where you just sort of say, okay, you know, there's a little exposure here that, you know, um, doesn't happen. But I think if you put it in the context of when it was happening, uh, and who he was and when he was painting them, it makes sense. The challenge is you fast forward to 2021, 20, two, and you know, the aftermath of Me Too and all these kinds of things, then there's a kind of different nuance for that. And sometimes I don't think that the perspective is able to be as open about that, you know, respecting his point of view and his perspective and the context in which he's making the painting. Well, I think that's a, a beautiful thing that you and Matthew do both in the catalog, but also with the selections that works if you made is that, yes, on a certain level, if you take, you know, one of these, a painting isolated from the show and you view it through the lens of, you know, what is happening in the world today, it could provoke in, in maybe right. a way that he didn't want. But, you know, the, I think you guys just really lay out um, the precision of the decisions he made in, in, re in reference to art history and to specific paintings and specific painters. And then also just, you know, the um, aspects of his own life that he embedded in all of those paintings. Like, you know, he's a very self-deprecating, like almost pathetic character in a lot of these paintings, yes. which is really, I think, important. It's not necessarily like um, this, you know, uh, I think a, maybe like a, a totally um, cliched, like male gaze on these things. It's one that's very much aware of his own failings and his own, um, you know, sort of personal experiences, which I think is really special. Um, that makes it, yeah, it makes it much more complicating and, and I think rewarding to kind of work through all of that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, like very often he's hapless, I call it like hapless in front of this beauty, you know, like his, all his sort of temptations, if you want, um, you know, like all out there. And he just sort of lets you know that he's, this is something that he, you know, has to deal with and 
he can be seduced, you know, by many, you know, different things. And I think that that taking that responsibility, I don't know if it's responsibility, but at least sort of like illuminating the personal impact, you know, like of the stuff and um, not sort of blowing it off on, you know, she's, you know, she seduced me. He allows himself to be seduced, you know, and uh, in, in a very kind of interesting but way. It's also even with something like Judgment of Paris, like you, oh, well, yes. it's also Judgment of Paris, and then you think about why did Rubens paint it like 22 times, and like for the same reason, you yeah. know, that Bob did, he wanted to yeah. paint these women, it was, you know, that's, that, that desire is also part of like the history of painting, which I think is forgotten sometimes that that was, you know, what these male painters have been thinking Hello. about for hundreds of years. So. Um, well, we're kind of, we're, I think one interesting thing about the show, we're in a room of paintings, you know, that are eventually from the late 80s into the early 90s, which was kind of after um, the period of the last, you know, uh, right. retrospective from, from 89. Um, you know, I think the evolution of style in this work is something that a lot of critics right now are talking about too, just how um, fearless he was as a painter, you know, in this room, you know, some of the things that he was even trying back in that Egyptian period, maybe come to the surface again. Um, you know, how, how did you perceive, like, let's say this era of his paintings in terms of evolution of style, you know, was it quite, you know, shocking or challenging to see these works that were so maybe painterly in a way that the, uh, the earlier works were not necessarily seeking to be? I don't think it was, uh, it was shocking. I mean, it was, it was interesting, you know, because in, in a way I'm seeing the development in his work through shows he's having. I'm not like living out in San Francisco, right. California, yeah. you know, like, so, um, you know, like every show is a surprise to me, you know, like, and, and a delight and to sort of see what he's sort of looking at and um, how he's developing. I thought it was um, kind of interesting because I was inter I was fascinated by the way that he would he he gradually began to really move away from um, sort of one point perspective to things and you know like really sort of enrich the surfaces from the kind of like post what I call the poster period you know in the seventies um, one thing that was really interesting because um, Matthew was was uh, really great in sort of collecting a lot of early. Uh, exhibitions he was in on the coast, which was something I was less familiar with. And um, this kind of trope of figures in the landscape with rocks and water, that you see in his work, you know, in the early 60s, yeah. you know, and how he comes back to things, you know, like I thought was like really um, interesting. His um, subject matter also really gets to sort of talk about Mm, how I want, how do I want to describe it? Sort of the um, the challenges of history when you go beyond a kind of linear Eurocentric one, and sort of bringing in characters and incidences and perspectives that uh, really sort of complicate, you know, like the ideas. And the part of the complication is crowding the figures into the the composition, so you have. In one painting, you can have 10 different vignettes of, of you know, what's going on. Um, and, but at the same time, his, his ability to create this visual unity, um, either through color, color shapes, or um, texture is really fascinating. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I think there is no, like, yeah, as you say, no one point perspective. You know, this is kind of like an all over history painting where you right. can enter at any moment and, you know, chart a path that leads you in completely surprising directions, which I think is what makes, you know, a work like Matthew Henson or this one next to it, they're so exciting and, yeah. and, and I think, you know, quite challenging because it's harder to, you know, read a, a clear narrative on history too. You can get as lost as he probably was thinking about these things. Well, I think, yeah, probably, I mean, he's sort of, you know, alerting us to the fact of the complexities of these, um, of, of these narratives that they don't. There was, there was one, uh, the emergency room at, at, in the collection of MoMA sort of inspired in me, um, you know, there's a, you know, the emergency room, the doctors and the half dead person and the priest and who, what are they doing? And these go up to the upper left and there's like, you know, some, some uh, you know, group of black men fighting. Over. And somehow there was something about that that kind of reminded me of a scene from 2001 where the the, the ape discovers the, um, the bone and the, the sort of percussive, you know, sort of uh, 
potential, you know, like of the bone to sort of be a lethal weapon. And I think that there was a way in which, for me, it, it sort of really reminded us of this kind of DNA that sort of stays with us, you know, like that we still have to um, sort of deal with. Another in this room that I think is really interesting is school bays, you know, where you have the uh, figure on the left pointing a gun right at you. I mean, it is so topical for today. Um, it, it's, it's almost, you know, scary with all these different people, you know, that who are actors in the, maybe the, the, the main thing, or maybe just apparitions of things coming from people's minds as they're reading books and things like that. And, you know, little scholastic football team and the, the sort of colonnaded, you know, um, brick building, you know, for, you know, in school. And, um, but there's something about that little gun pointed right at you that is like really uh, quite powerful, you know, um, and uh, you can't get away from it. Well, as he moves to the end of like, you know, the work becomes very lyrical. And, you know, I think one interesting thing that I got even talking to some of his children was like, you know, seeing how even the process for him changed a bit towards the 90s. And in the end where these, these are not so plotted out, there's not like a million puppetry no. drawings. Like he would really just start with an image and then kind of riff on it. And the forms would kind of, you know, be discovered in the process of painting, which I think is what makes those late paintings, especially even though, you know, the very in ones where he's kind of battling Parkinson's so powerful and moving that he was just thinking through paint in, in a way that was, you know, really, I think, you know, a uh, radical. For, you know. No, I, th I think that's a really good point because I think that, you know, he probably at that time is so used to everybody coming and sort of parsing each corner, you know, like of the painting to find some you know, meaning and story and stuff. And then in those you can't find and <laughs> sit there and go, okay, so that cloud is forming a woman. And then, uh, oh, there's that big old cat over there. What's that doing there? You know, like, I mean, it's, it's like total um, free mental, you know, um, invention. And then the latest paintings, you know, after he has Par Parkinsonian uh, syndrome where he, you know, can't, it just goes back to this kind of abstraction and, and you get a sense of how he builds up the painting because he doesn't c totally cover over the magenta underpainting that everybody talked about that he used, uh, you know, like in, in his work. And it becomes a very kind of interesting sort of um, spatial play that, that, that's really quite fanciful and quite beautiful. I mean, you, you don't, necessarily use the word beauty, you know, in terms of Colescott, but the, I think the uh, uh, late paintings are really quite beautiful. Well, maybe just one last, or maybe one or two more questions. Um, you know, so after having worked with Colescott for so many years, you know, how do you, you know, how does it feel to have this sort of long-term relationship? Like, what has he meant to your career? And, you know, it's, it's not necessarily so often that a curator does have such a sustained, you know, exhibiting relationship with an artist, you may, you know, stay in touch, but to really, you know, work with him, you know, at the beginning of your career, or at least, you know, in the early early years of your career, and now, you know, um, in, in 2022, what does that feel like? I think um, organizing this show was like a sense of completion, you know, because previous surveys of his work were these 10 year increments. Right. And, you know, the, the, as you mentioned, there's a new generation of painters, you know, coming in. And I thought, you know, particularly as the estate got, you know, like some things came together, events came together. The estate, you know, being uh, represented by Blum and Poe, their sort of completion of the inventory of what was in the, the studio and in the estate and the ability to sort of bring in the early work that people had never seen to sort of really show that in, in from the beginning, he was always about painting. Um, and even though it got very sparse in the 70s, you know, like that impulse to paint was, was always there. So for me, it was really um, an opportunity to sort of round it up, you know, like, you know, for me. And um, I think that um, I've sort of, you know, encountered, you know, younger scholars like Matthew Wesley, um, uh, 
who you don't want to take on, you know, sort of moving it to like the next, you know, step. Um, I don't, you know, I never really planned on <laughs> being married to Bob for 40 years, but um, I think it was also, um, he had a really discreet, tight group around him. Um, and so like we all had to sort of like continually pitch in to sort of like really uh, get his message out, you know, in a way. So for me, it's kind of like um, a coda, you know, like for the for this long term involvement. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad I hung in there, you know, um, very grateful to the CAC and Rafael Plateau, who was the director at the time, and immensely uh, thankful for the new museum for bringing it to New York. Well, we feel really lucky that it's here. It feels yeah. like part of our history in, in a really yeah, important exactly, way. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think that's great. Well, Larry, thank you so much um, for the show and for the conversation. And My uh, pleasure. We'll be continuing to think about Paul Scott for a long time, I'm sure. So. We'll keep you going for a while. <laughs>